So they're preparing for war? Wow. Um, with whom? What do you mean they're not sure? Wait, 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 wait. But they think it's going to happen. Oh, they want it to happen. No. No, that's just weird. Okay. September 12th, 1941. Since invading the USSR June 22nd, Germany has taken enormous amounts of territory and prisoners. The Soviet Red Army has still continued to fight, however, and this week something happens that the Germans did not plan on. A Soviet victory. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Romania halted its attacks on Odessa for the time being. Soviet attacks failed against Heinz Guderian's advancing panzers, and the war was two years old. There were also some successful Soviet attacks last week, though, against the Yelnya salient. Now, Georgi Zhukov had ordered Konstantin Rakuten's 24th Army to start assaulting the five divisions of the German 4th Army there August 17th. Those first attacks failed after a few days, but Zhukov pressed Stavka to order more. Meanwhile, Rakuten's forces were beefed up to 10 divisions by the 23rd, including two tank divisions and one motorized division. Stavka ordered the attack renewed the 25th, with Rakuten to take the Yelnya bridgehead and Pavel Karochkin's 43rd army to take Roslavo. Well, Rakuten attacked last week on the 30th and broke through the German forward lines after extremely heavy fighting. By the 4th, his northern and southern shock groups had enveloped the Germans and threatened them with encirclement. Because of all the other fighting on the line, as we saw, the Germans could not be reinforced either. So Army Group Center didn't really have much choice except a fighting retreat. Last week on the 5th, the 19th Soviet Rifle Division penetrated into Yelnya. And now on the 6th, with the help of four more rifle divisions, captures the city. After that, Rakuten's forces pursue the Germans across the Desna River and for 25 kilometers, and by the 8th, have reached the German defenses along the Ustrom and Striana rivers, where they are finally halted. Also on the 8th, after three weeks of offensive actions, the Red Army's Western Front is ordered to halt and go on the defensive. They have made only limited gains and taken huge casualties in actions like that which we saw last week. But back to Yelnia. This is a big deal. Now, without air support or serious armor, they could not totally surround and destroy the Germans there, but they did penetrate prepared German defenses and retake a pretty decent sized chunk of territory. And that is the first time in the nearly three months of the invasion that the Red Army has done that. They did take over 30,000 casualties from a force of around 100,000 men, but they won. That is something new. But Adolf Hitler does not think his forces are going to be pushed back for long. For also on the 6th comes Fuhrer Directive 35. It says that following the surrounding and destruction of the Red Army facing Army Group Center, its commander Fedor von Bock is to begin the advance on Moscow with his right flank on the Oka and his left on the Upper Volga. Hepner's Panzer Group 4 is to be brought down to make the largest possible breakthrough. The aim is to defeat the forces on the Moscow Road before the winter. The operation is to be called Typhoon. Already on the 9th, British analysts at Bletchley decrypt the intercepted orders for Typhoon. On the 10th, Hitler issues yet more orders. Before attacking Moscow, his forces must complete the encirclement of the Red Army holding out in Ukraine. But even without waiting for this to happen, General Otto von Waldo writes the 9th, We are heading for a winter campaign. The real trial of this war has begun. It's not the only thing beginning this week. On the 8th, the Siege of Leningrad begins. Now, you can count from other dates, of course, if you like, like when the Moscow Railway was cut. But German forces lay siege to the Soviet Union's second largest city. See. Army Group North Commander Wilhelm von Lieb's forces reach the Gulf of Finland, so Leningrad is only accessible across Lake Ladoga, and that is a very tenuous lifeline. The Germans seize Schlüsselburg VIII, which is a big deal because it puts the Germans in control of pretty much all ground communication between the city and the rest of the country. In fact, the loss of Schlüsselburg 
convinces Stavka that the battle for Leningrad is near its end. That day, the Germans dropped 6,000 incendiary bombs on the city, not only killing multitudes of the citizenry, but also destroying hundreds of tons of food supplies in the four-acre Badaev warehouse. If the siege lasts for long, starvation might well come to Leningrad. Also that day, between Lake Ladoga and Lake Onega, Finnish attacks cross the Sphere and take Lodenoy Pule, cutting the Soviet railway south from Murmansk. At the moment, British and American supplies are coming to Archangel and not Murmansk, but in the winter, that will not be possible without icebreaking. Finnish attacks have complicated things a bit up there. All through July, they had limited their actions to the region west of Lakes Ladoga and Onega against the Soviet 7th Army. Since then, they have attacked the 23rd Army, defending Karelia, and pushed it back to just 30 kilometers from the city's northern defenses. So even though they have not advanced any further, just the threat of a possible Finnish attack throws a wrench into the city's defenses. There are around 450,000 soldiers in the Leningrad front, two-thirds of them south of the city, facing roughly an equal number of Germans, while east of Schlüsselburg, Grigory Kulik has 85,000 men in the 54th Army at Volkov. This week, Joseph Stalin sends Zhukov to replace Klim Voroshilov in command of the Leningrad front. But still, German high command has thought the city was, was theirs for the taking, and to avoid unnecessary casualties, Hitler's Directive 35 orders the city surrounded and starved. Five tank divisions, two motorized ones, and most of the air support that Army Group has is to leave the front within a week to go help with Operation Typhoon at Drive on Moscow, since he has 30 Soviet divisions trapped in Leningrad. In the south, though, his forces have 50 divisions trapped in a huge pocket, so it'll be first Kiev and then Moscow. Heinz Kuderian's panzers have been making for Kiev, and last week were engaged by Andrei Yeramenko's Bryansk front. By this week, Yeramenko is struggling to avoid disaster, and Guderian continues unchecked. He crosses the Desna the 10th and heads for Romny in the rear of the Soviets. Yeramenko gets new orders the 12th to halt his offensive, regroup, and then attack Guderian's flank. He is to close the gap between the Bryansk and southwestern fronts, which is 60 kilometers by now, no later than September the 18th. On the 7th, Red Army Chief of Staff Boris Shaposhnikov and Deputy Chief of Staff Alexander Vasilevsky try to convince Joseph Stalin to withdraw Mikhail Kirponos' forces from Kiev. They argue that not only is their position dangerous, but also that by this time, he's going to have big problems even doing that. Vasilevsky describes Stalin's reaction. The conversation was tough and uncompromising. Stalin reproached us, saying that like Semyon Budeni, we took the line of least resistance, retreating instead of beating the enemy. They at least do manage to convince him to let Kirponos withdraw the 5th and 37th armies to better defensive positions. On the 10th and 11th, Panzer Group Kleist begins breaking out of the Dnieper bridgehead around Kremenchug, which they reached last week. Budeni, head of the Southwestern Direction Command, understands the threat this is, but he does not have the forces to halt it. And as the week ends, Kleist's panzers have carved a wedge 20 kilometers wide between the Soviet 38th and 6th armies. On the 10th, Kirponos asks both Stavka and Shaposhnikov permission to withdraw his front. No dice. Stalin tells Kirponos the 11th, do not abandon Kiev and do not blow up the bridges without Stavka permission. On the 11th, Budeni again appeals to Stalin to be allowed to withdraw from Kiev. The senior party official in the city, Nikita Khrushchev, also signs the appeal. Spoiler. Budeni is dismissed from his post early next week and Semyon Timoshenko replaces him partly over this. The week ends and they are not to withdraw from Kiev and the first snowfall on the Eastern Front is reported September 12th, though no snow settles. There are other scattered notes from around the Eastern Fronts this week. On the 8th, Stalin orders all Volga Germans deported to Siberia. This is 600,000 or so ethnic Germans that have lived in the region for a couple hundred years. With Kiev under fire, he's worried about sabotage and subversion. 
on the 9th, the Blue Division, volunteers from Spain, arrives to begin service in the German Army on the Leningrad Front with Army Group North. And this week, the 151st RAF Wing sees its first action in the north of the Soviet Union. From the base at Vyenga, they shoot down three German planes for the loss of one of their own. So more and more players are joining the fray. Well, we've seen the war grow and grow as the months roll on, not just in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, but also in East Asia. But over there, Japan is considering making it soon grow a lot larger. On the 6th, Prime Minister Konoye gives in to military pressure and an imperial conference decides that, in view of the declining oil stocks, war preparations should be completed by mid-October and that if no agreement is reached by then, that the decision to go to war should be taken. Konoye continues to make some conciliatory proposals to the U.S., but is judged insincere, despite the advice of Joseph Gru, the American ambassador in Tokyo, that if no agreement is reached, the moderate Konoye may be replaced by a military dictatorship. Well, those war preparations are against Britain, the United States, and the Dutch. Japan has no intention of attacking the USSR to aid Germany. And the Japanese do not think the Soviets will collapse. In fact, they think they had best make their move to the south while the USSR is busy fighting the Germans. The meeting today is the last of a series over the past few weeks, and they will go to war to try to seize Southeast Asia. They will keep talking to the US, sure, but if they don't give in on all points, it will be war with them too. So the sooner the army and the navy are ready, the better. The expectation was that in the early stages of the war, Japan would win great victories and that there would be a stalemate and a new peace acknowledging her gains. All the key figures, including the Prime Minister, the Army, and the Navy were in agreement. Only Emperor Hirohito had doubts, but in the face of unanimous advice, he could only consent. And this week comes to an end, with Japanese resolve to make war in the Pacific German resolve to make war on Moscow, Soviet worries in Ukraine, and a Soviet victory in the center of the front. And that is, as I said, a big deal. Of course, the Germans have suffered setbacks in the field here and there so far during the war, but this is something new. The Soviets not only won at Yelnia against prepared German defenses, they also tied down German reinforcements and they won the battle after two and a half months of withstanding the largest invasion in history and not crumbling as Germany and most of the world thought they would. They are actively turning the tables on Germany and that is something new. The Japanese may actually be right. Hitler may have bitten off more than he can chew. Japan has its own experience invading a huge country expecting to win quickly and then not doing so. If you'd like to see Japan's invasion of China in 1937, you can click right here for our Between Two Wars episode about that. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Konstantinos Spiropoulos. That's a great name, isn't it? Konstantinos okay. Spiropoulos, with a Y in Spear. Okay. Join the Time Ghost Army and help us continue to make great content like this at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.